Greetings, my dear friends. This is Chax or Commander Chakrapani with one more episode of Chax Simplifies. Trade makes the world go around. An old adage. Almost everybody believes by it. And indeed it does. Trade routes, as far as mankind is concerned, are as old as mankind itself. Long, long back, it was the Indus Valley civilization which spawned many a trade route across Asia to Europe. With the advent of bandits and robbers on land, it became more convenient to ship goods by the sea. Indus Valley civilization is known to have expanded its roots all the way into Africa and Europe. An astrolabe was first used by the Indus Valley Civilization. No wonder it is the seaborne trade which is most prominent essentially because it is cheaper, faster and most cost effective. Maritime trade is the backbone to international trade and global economy. 80% of the global trade by volume and over 70% by value is carried by the sea and handled by the ports worldwide. The global market of this trade was about $170 billion in 2020 and projected to reach $190 billion by 2028. 11 billion tons of goods are transported by ships every year. In 2019 alone, the total value of annual world's shipping trade had reached over $14 trillion. Every year, the shipping industry transports 2 billion tons of oil, 1 billion tons of iron ore, the raw material needed to create steel, and 350 million tons of grain besides all other things. These shipments could just not be possible by road, by rail, or by air. To support the global economy, shipping has developed a very highly sophisticated logistics chain delivering just-in-time parts, goods to manufacturers and to the consumers. With over 60,000 merchant ships at any moment at sea, carrying over 6 million custom containers, oil, natural gas, chemicals at all, no wonder shipping industry is like the artery of the globe carrying the lifeblood to its economy. Due to natural features, all shipping must necessarily converge into small areas which are otherwise called the choke points. A threat to any of the choke points can jeopardize global trade. Don't forget, just a few months back, merchant vessel Evergreen Blockade blocked the Suez Canal for just about a week, but it disrupted $10 billion and more of global trade, putting into a tailspin many a supply chain, causing widespread delays across the globe. That was an accident. A deliberate attempt to blockade any of the choke points can really speaking trigger wars and maybe even a world war. Welcome my dear friends to Chak Simplifies, your channel to simplify complex geopolitical issues. In this episode, we shall look at the Indian Ocean region. Don't forget, this is the Navy week and the Indian Navy is at its focus. So we'll talk about the Indian Ocean region. Look at the major choke points here. Essentially, 
the straits of hormuz the straits of babel mandap and the malacca straits we will look at the concept of the indo pacific and how is it an extension of the indian ocean region what are india's maritime security interests and how india is upholding or trying to uphold its interests are there any evidences which prove or which point that india is capable of doing such a thing and we shall take a look at two such incidents one the all of government approach to the endemans as the unsinkable aircraft carriers and of course the ability and demonstrated resolve as a part of operation cactus we will do some crystal ball gazing and see what is up ahead as far as the foreseeable future is concerned many a century back admiral alfred thayer mahan predicted whoever controls the indian ocean will dominate asia this ocean is the key to the seven seas in the 21st century the destiny of the world would be decided on its waters look at what is happening today and you will realize how true how precise admiral mahan was the indian ocean is the world's third largest ocean covers approximately 20% of the earth's surface important sea lanes of communications or slocks as they are called connect africa asia and australia and through them to the atlantic and the pacific over 80% of global petroleum transits through the indian ocean region and especially the choke points that we shall talk about the choke points of malacca babel mandap and hormuz the indian ocean region and its peripheral waters remain vulnerable to pirates and armed robbers maritime terrorists illicit traders environmental issues brought about by climate change or maybe even destructive human activity and great power rivalry with freedom of navigation for a long time the indian ocean region was considered a region of peace with not with no nuclear weapons that has changed however one major difference of the indian ocean with the rest of the world is this maritime disputes here have been resolved by talks and discussions and treaties for example the resolution of new more island and the exclusive economic zone and the boundary between bangladesh and india let's take a look at the three major choke points as far as the indian ocean is concerned starting from the straits of hormuz the straits of hormuz connect the persian gulf to the indian ocean this region that's the region of the persian gulf is loaded with oil and gas oil as you know is the lubricant of global economy oil cannot be produced it can only be extracted not surprisingly it is the gl largest globally traded commodity today over 50% of the world's oil reserves and over 40% of natural gas is in the persian gulf region just one oil field the gwahar in saudi arabia produces 6% of global oil 15% plus of the global energy transits through the straits of hormuz no other choke point anywhere in the globe is as important as this 
about 167 kilometers long, 39 kilometers in width at its narrowest, Straits of Hormuz is characterized by shallow waters and eight islands that make navigation very tricky. Incidentally, seven of these eight islands are controlled by Iran. There is a traffic separation scheme in place. However, you must remember, much of this traffic separation scheme passes through the territorial waters of Iran. Iran has developed a sea denial capability with very low cost option of sea mines. The silkworm missiles provided by China and its ability to use the islands and the fast attack craft and gunboats to be able to harass shipping in the Straits of Hormuz give it a unique but a difficult to match capability. This area is also marked by intense rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Let's move on to the Straits of Babel Mandap. These are the gateway to the Red Sea and through the Suez Canal into the Mediterranean. These straits at one time were called Gateway of Tears essentially due to the navigation hazards here, but today due to the Somali piracy. 35% of all traded oil and gas destined for the European market, which marks about 8% of world's global trade, passes through here. 50% of world's container traffic, which is approximately 80% of the trade between Europe and Asia, passes through this. There is another conflict which is ongoing here, the conflict between Yemen and Saudi Arabia. The Houthi rebels of Yemen are supported by Iran and they have liberally used drones to attack the Saudi oil complexes. A large number of bases in this area are existing essentially to ensure freedom of navigation and safety of shipping in the guise of anti-piracy patrols. From the US to Europe, from China to India, naval ships of all many countries maintain a 24-7, 365-day vigil against piracy in this part. Don't forget, India also maintains its anti-piracy patrols here. Let's move on to the Straits of Malacca. About 580 nautical miles or 930 kilometers long, the Straits of Malacca are the gateway to the South China Sea. About 100,000 ships transit these straits annually. They are probably the world's busiest straits. They cater for 80% of Chinese trade. India, with its presence in the Great Nicobar Islands, just on top of the six degree channel can literally choke them. That is probably the primary reason why China is looking to in somehow manage to bypass these trades and the origin of the Belt and Road Initiative stems from here. They tried to develop the Kra Canal through the Kra Peninsula or the Isthmus really, in Thailand. However, the United States and India, along with help from Singapore, managed to scuttle this attempt. These trades were also prone to piracy, especially from Indonesia. However, the last few years have been relatively calm. If you look at the piracy map, as far as the Indian Ocean region is concerned, you will see this area around Somalia, Babel Mandap, is very deeply infested 
with some incidents happening in the Malacca Straits and thereafter. So what are India's security concerns? Don't forget, over 95% of India's trade comes from the seas. Don't also forget, the only invaders into India that came in, conquered and left were the British who came from the sea. Therefore, India has to battle not just geography, but also history. It has a vested interest in a safe and free Indian Ocean region and by extension, the Indo-Pacific. It wants to maintain its preeminent status in the Indian Ocean region, keep its slocks or the shipping lanes of communications free, counter radicalization and terrorism. It also needs to break free from the stranglehold of what is called as the string of pearls from the Chinese diplomacy. It has to counter China in Djibouti, Gwadar, Karachi, Malé, Hambantota, Myanmar, Bangladesh. It needs to maintain its access and the, to the economic resources, oil and gas, and more importantly, the polymetallic nodules in the deep sea region allocated to it, which is approximately 75,000 square kilometers in the central Indian Ocean. Fisheries is an important part of the economic benefits India derives from here. So is India really speaking, looking at its interests and doing something to safeguard them? Well, indeed it has. It has formed, promoted and developed the Indian Ocean Rim Association or IORA. A natural extension of its presence in the Indian Ocean region into the Indo-Pacific is very clear. And since it cannot counter China, especially the Chinese Navy, all by itself, it has gone in for alliances. Quad being one of the major ones with the United States, Japan and Australia. Quad plus with a few other Asian economies getting into the bandwagon, especially South Korea, is something which may happen quite soon. Quad plus plus with countries like France, Germany, UK may also well happen. The BIMSTEC and Alliance and the exercises that India does with the Bay of Bengal littoral called Milan, the other exercises bilaterally or multilaterally from Malabar to whatever else are all steps in that direction. The proof of the pudding, as they say, is always the eating. And we shall take a look at two such proof points. One, where India showed its resolve, determination and capability in thwarting a military coup in Mali, Operation Cactus in 1988. And today, an all-of-government approach in developing the Andaman Nicobar Islands, especially the Great Nicobar Island. Let's take a look at the Indian Ocean Rim Association or the IORA. Established in the March 1997, it has 22 member states with nine dialogue partners. Home to about 2.7 billion people or 40% of global population, it has identified for itself two focus areas. Blue economy, which will look at renewable ocean energy, fisheries and aquaculture, offshore hydrocarbons and minerals, marine research, tourism and resolution of interstate disputes and the second being maritime security and safety with port security and governance, counter extremism and terrorism including anti-piracy, illicit trade 
and maritime domain awareness, creation of information fusion centers started with Singapore and now at New Delhi, actually Gurgaon. This will help India to be aware of what is happening in its own backyard. Now you realize the moment we look at the map and extend this eastwards, the Indo-Pacific is a natural extension. It essentially adds the Pacific region. The only big difference here is the belligerent China. The numerous disputes that have been taking place because of belligerence of China and the great power rivalry which is on between US and China. India, no prizes for guessing, is going to be the linchpin of this. How the role of Quad occurs and how will China and, the, and Russia respond will form the bedrock of changes that may take place. So let's take a look at the South China Sea. The South China Sea is marred by disputes. China claims most of it under what it calls the Nine Dash Line, drawn by Mao Zedong many, many years back. They claim a historical perspective, but none of it is acceptable in today's world. They have maritime disputes from Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei, Philippines, Thailand, going on to Taiwan, Japan. Nobody has been left here untouched. It has gone ahead and constructed artificial islands and built airstrips as well as missile sites to be able to dominate this area. Philippines dragged it to the International Court of Arbitration and the court ruled in Philippines' favor. Yet, China says, so what? We don't accept it. So why is South China Sea so important? $3.4 trillion equivalent of global trade passes through the South China Sea. Approximately one third of the global maritime trade. 80% of Chinese imports and 40% of total trade happens through here. Potentially significant but unexplored oil and gas reserves have been found. It is home to among the world's best fishing grounds, accounting for approximately 10% of fish. China, therefore, has used its artificial islands plus its fishing fleet as a de facto occupying force utilizing it in Mischief Reef, Senkaku Islands and other places. You can't talk of South China Sea without talking of Taiwan. Taiwan deserves a special mention as for China, it is the ultimate price. Taiwan is the main barrier for China to venture out freely into the South China Sea and from there into the Pacific Ocean. Taiwan is like the unsinkable aircraft carrier guarding the South China Sea and the Pacific. So what does China do? It does what is called as the cry wolf tactic. Frequent air incursions into the Taiwanese ADIZ. You would be surprised to know over 750 sorties have been done in the last 12 months alone. The, among the largest such incursion was 56 aircraft, which included 36 J-15, 12 H-6 nuclear capable strategic bombers, a total of over 144 aircraft over a 24 hour period. It has conducted amphibious drills across the Taiwan Strait in the province of Fujian. 
it has commanded its own transport fleet which now accounts for the world's largest transport fleet to be able to move amphibious forces and vehicles across the straits no wonder taiwan is expanding its military budget embarked on a major modernization drive and the united states and other nations have come to stand in its favor let's take a look at the indian presence in the indian ocean region from iran to the uae from seychelles to madagascar from reunion island to diego garcia from maldives to sri lanka from australia to myanmar and bangladesh through singapore malaysia indonesia thailand india has a presence across the ior and generally very good relations in the region now let's take a look at we we spoke about proof of the pudding let's take two incidents like we spoke about the operation cactus which happened between the 3rd and the 6th november 1988 which showed not just the capability but also the resolve and determination the ability to be able to use all the three services together to deliver its objective as far as india is concerned in the night of 2nd and 3rd november 80 plus mercenaries of plot displaced the then president gayum under the leadership of latifi in the morning of 3rd november gayum finally asked india for help because everyone else he asked from pakistan to sri lanka from uk to the us singapore all refused saying that we just can't do it within hours at 1745 hours actually two il38s take off from agra for male they land at male at 2130 hours in less than an hour by 2230 the male airport was secured early in the morning of 4th november by 0230 hours the president was rescued and by 4043 hours male was knocked up the mercenaries left male on a ship progress light by 7:30 hours an indian naval il38 spots progress light on the 5th of november ins betwa and ins godavari intersect progress light by 06 the 30 hours or later 0700 hours the mercenaries were captured the tri service mission in absolute wuka condition that is volatile uncertain complex and unambiguous came to a conclusion don't forget and also it will be quite surprising india did not have a map of male airport all the maps the indian forces had were tourist maps picked up from tourism offices in agra let's move on to the current situation there are the past let's move on right now the andaman nicobar islands which showcase an all of government approach as far as ensuring and safeguarding india's strategic and maritime interests The Andaman Nicobar Islands are 572 islands, of which only 38 are inhabited. 450 nautical miles in length. They are just about 22 nautical miles from Myanmar, that is the Cocos Island, and 90 nautical miles from Indonesia, the Aceh. They were the first free Indian territory where Netaji Subhash proclaimed Indian independent India from Port Blair. the islands of shaheed and swaraj which are actually neel and havelock respectively broadly 
two set of islands, the Andaman group in the north and the Nicobar group in the south. These islands straddle the 10 degree channel right opposite the Chrysostomus and the Kraken Isle planned by China and the 6 degree channel which leads into the Malacca Straits. The Andamans have been the staging post for Indian humanitarian aid, whether it was the water crisis in Maldives in 2016 or during various natural disasters where Indian Navy rushed to the aid of Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Bangladesh and Indonesia. They provide a quick and easy access to the South China Sea and the airports in the islands right from the north, Diglipur or Sipur, Port Blair, Karnicobar and Campbell Bay which is in the greater Nicobar Islands, GNI for short, all are able to take long-range maritime patrol aircrafts including the P-8I Poseidon fighter aircraft from Mirage 2000 to the Su-30 and of course supports amphibious operations also. India conducts numerous bilateral and multilateral exercises from here. Take the Great Nicobar Islands. Look at the all of government approach. From developing maritime trade and a transshipment point at Galatia Bay to a free trade zone with a warehousing complex, shipbuilding and repair facility to fisheries. There is an estimation of 12 million tons of fish in the waters of the Andaman Nicobar. Some claim about 10 million tons of these fish die every year of old age. India seeks to develop an entire fisheries ecosystem right from fishing to warehousing, from processing to exports. Ecotourism is going to be a major benefit here. And don't forget the gloved military. From India's springboard into the Indo-Pacific as a part of the new Lukis policy to the ship repair yard, two floating docks, and the connectivity from land, sea, and air for reconnaissance aircraft as well as fighters. So where do we go from here? The Indian Ocean region, my dear friends, is an area of increasing geostrategic rivalry and importance. India has a role to play both as a participant and as an eminent power in the region. In many ways, India is the guarantor of peace and security for smaller nations. Key concerns will always be the strategic sensitivities of the Indo-Pacific maritime domain, the geopolitical competition between the superpowers, aggressive Chinese behavior in India's immediate proximity and the security threats due to piracy, illicit trafficking, acts of terrorism. India has a lot at stake. 95% of trade, over 65% of its oil needs come from the maritime side. It has traditionally very good relations with most countries in the region. However, it still has to counter the Chinese Navy, which is very active out here. From the port, facilities and the base in Djibouti, where it is likely to station upwards of 10,000 people to Gwadar on a 40-year lease. Karachi, where it is spending $3.5 billion in redevelopment of the port. Hambantota on a 99-year-old lease. No wonder India has a lot on its plate and has to play its cards very well. Not surprisingly, Prime Minister Modi used the first opportunity India had as a part of the Security Council in August 2021, where it chaired 
a first ever debate on enhancing maritime security a case for international cooperation much against chinese efforts vision of sagar that security and growth for all in the region as proposed by india has been very well received it has gone in for strategic alliances with quad forthcoming quad plus bimstech melon and some sort of a support role probably in ocus undoubtedly india has to develop blue water navy capabilities it needs a minimum of three aircraft carriers to be able to control the seas around itself nuclear submarines both the ssn and the ssbn variety to be able to dominate and deny the seas ensure its sea denial capabilities as far as the malacca straits are concerned therefore increasing the malacca dilemma for china much better maritime domain awareness using lrmp aircraft and surveillance and a robust powerful coast guard india is on its way to reclaim its preeminence as far as the indian ocean region is concerned and play a major part in the indo pacific the game dear friends is on and we in india this time are right in the middle of it we continue to live in very interesting times dear friends if you approve of the video please do leave a, leave a like and please do comment these motivate me immensely as always don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you have not already done so and press the bell icon to be notified of any new videos please feel free to share this video with your friends and acquaintances and anyone you feel would benefit from it as always i look forward to your suggestions and continued support until next time jai hind